Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the third of four webinars in UC Irvine Extension's eighth annual GATE webinar series. Today's topic is acknowledging and supporting the spiritual lives of gifted children. This session is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. If you register through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email tomorrow with a link to this recording. And many of you did register through our free events website. So again, you will automatically receive an email from me tomorrow with the recording link. My name is Lisa Kotowaki and I'm a program manager here at UC Irvine Extension. Here's a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features. So you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I'll provide you with some information about several GATE resources offered through UCI Extension, including our fully online GATE Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 28th. Then I'll hand it over to Dr. Paula Wilkes, as she will be presenting on today's topic, Acknowledging and Supporting the Spiritual Lives of Gifted Children. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session, and then I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI John and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for our speaker regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel and we will address it at the end of the webinar if we have time. So if you don't already see the chat panel appearing on the right hand side of your screen, you'll want to look for a chat bubble icon. Go ahead and click that chat bubble icon and the chat panel will show up. Um, again, if you have a question regarding the presentation, feel free to submit it during the presenta presentation and then at the end, we'll try to leave the last few minutes for Q&A and we will hopefully address your questions then. Here's a brief overview of the GATE Specialized Studies program we have here at UC Irvine Extension. Our certificate program is fully online and consists of three required courses and three elective units. Our program is taught by a team of experienced instructors and is designed for individuals both new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for the certificate, students must complete all nine units with a letter grade of C or better as well as a completed request for certificate form. The courses in the program range from $375 to $500 per course, just depending on the unit value. And you can take individual courses without pursuing the entire certificate program. Here's a list of the required and elective courses that make, make up our GATE Specialized Studies program. The topics in the program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of the needs and issues of this diverse group of students. Now, when you're viewing this course schedule online, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so you do want to plan accordingly. And you'll also want to pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee as well as how long the course will last. You can earn your certificate in as little as nine months and can choose elective topics that are of greatest interest to you. Here's a list of the courses that we're offering in the upcoming spring quarter. Um, we're offering a required course, differentiated instruction, and then as far as the elective courses, learning styles and engaging students through technology. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and information are also posted on our website. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. We do encourage students to enroll at least two weeks prior to the course start date. As you may already know, UC Irvine hosts an online gate community that is free and open to the public. You'll want to be sure to follow the directions on this slide, which is um, emailing me your first and last name as well as your email address. And I can get, um, give you access to the valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE within the community. We also post all of the, our past webinar recordings in this online GATE community. So if you're interested in getting access to those, please feel free to send me over your information. 
UCI Extension also provides individual courses, specialized in-services, and the entire GATE certificate program on-site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. So depending on the cohort size, we offer 10, 15, or 20% off course fees. If you want to learn more about our program and discuss your GATE training and professional development needs, please feel free to contact me. My information is on this slide. Later this month, California Association for the Gifted, or CAG, is hosting its annual conference in Palm Springs, California. UC Irvine Extension will be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend the CAG conference, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and write a reflection paper. The credit will appear on an official transcript that can be used for professional development or towards salary requirements uh, for salary advancement. So for those of you who are attending the conference, please feel free to send me an email and I can email you the official enrollment form or you can also look for the enrollment form at our table at the CAG conference. We are also offering a credit option for those of you who plan on attending all of the webinars in this eighth annual series. So currently the one tonight is the third webinar and then we'll have the last one next week. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend all four live webinars, totaling four hours, submit an official enrollment form with payment, and turn in the assignments as outlined on this slide. You can email me again at the address listed on this slide for the official enrollment form. And for those of you who are currently a student or interested in enrolling on our GATE Specialized Studies program, if you do either one of these credit options, either the one for the CAD conference or the one for this webinar series, the one unit of credit can count as one unit of elective credit in our GATE Specialized Studies program. So to wrap up my portion of the presentation, um, hopefully you saw some courses that may have piqued your interest. Um, again, our spring quarter classes are currently open for registration and they will start as early as March 28th. Um, at this time, I would like to go ahead and hand over the presenter ball to Dr. Paula Wilkes. Paula is a gifted education consultant at Summit Center in Los Angeles. Prior to Summit Center, she was an associate professor and public school teacher. We're excited to have her logged in today to present on the topic, acknowledging and supporting the spiritual lives of gifted children. So let me go and hand that presenter ball over to you, Paula. Can you hear us okay? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to welcome you all to this session that's devoted to your spiritual sensitivity and that of the children you're either trying to raise and nourish or the students that you're teaching. And this is going to be an invitation to connect with yourself in a transcendent presence. And if that seems odd to some of you, you're unsure about this, I hope you'll just hang in there with me and go through this session. I'm going to try to remain mindful of what you in this afternoon. Some of you might even feel a spiritual shift simply by deeply participating in this session. So this picture here on the cover of my presentation is our granddaughter, Lucy, when she was very young. She's now three. And this is an example of how we were leading her through spiritual sensitivity, and this is her giving us the sign for love. This painting is a wonderful visual metaphor for me. I really like finding visuals that represent something that I've experienced or something that I'm feeling. And it is a great depiction of the connection that my being feels after I do meditation or qigong. It's when I make a connection with other spiritual beings, it's a kind of a spiritual magnetism. So I'd like us to try to see if we can feel a magnetic wave of the energy of this gathering. So I'm gonna ask all of us to take a deep breath in through our nose and release it slowly. And another breath in and release it slowly. Okay. 
Now I'd like you to bring your hands toward each other without touching, as though you are creating a ball of snow with your hands. So you're moving your hands as though they're compressing some snow. Very gently, see if you can move the hands near each other without touching, so maybe you can feel your own energy in your hand. And now I'd like you to take one hand and put it at your heart center and the other one on your belly. And I'm going to ask you to take a breath in and then breathe out love through your heart into this gathering. And in a gathering of people who are interested in gifted children, there will be many of us who are highly sensitive enough to feel the energy of the other people in this group. So what does it mean to be spiritually sensitive? Many of you have read about Dabrowski's overexcitabilities, the sensual, intellectual, imaginational, psychomotor, and emotional. And spiritual sensitivity includes many aspects of these same character, same categories, but I believe it stands on its own as a very important sensitivity that is experienced by many gifted children and adults. And it includes profound empathy and exceptional emotional depth, a visionary insight and the ability to see the truth of situations, a gift for healing, and in fact, people with spiritual sensitivity alienated from the world around them. And these so-called gifts, which I really see now as gifts, can also lead to loneliness and self-doubt. And we're going to explore how to help spiritually sensitive children and adults build on the blessings of this gift and diminish the challenges. One of my favorite books is the book, The Spiritual Child. The author takes a look at research that's related to spiritual sensitivity and looks at it cross-culturally. And she says, the primary engine that drives natural spirituality is innate, biological, and developmental. First, an inborn faculty for transcendent connection, then a developmental impetus to make it our own, and the resulting deep personal relationship with a transcendent through nature, God, or the universal force. So here are some key points that I've pulled out from her book. It is an inner spiritual compass that is part of our biological development. That adolescent surge of spiritual awakening is seen in every culture. Spirituality is the child's greatest source of resilience they have as a human being. And a personal relationship with the transcendent happens when we individuate as spiritual beings. And I've been reading another new book recently called From Creating on Purpose. And I don't have a slide for it because it's just something that I've recently started reading. But I came to a page where it had a heading called How You Can Tell If You're Opening to the Divine. And here are the things this author says. I feel the presence of grace. I hear guidance from someone or something outside of me. I experience a miracle, coincidence, or synchronicity. I notice new ideas popping into my head. I received sudden insights into long-standing problems or issues. I connected with the right information at the right time. I feel an increased sense of joy and lightness. I have the sense of being on purpose. 
And I will tell you that in my own um, spiritual journey, these things have happened to me, and they're expanding more and more. Even I even had something happen today that I'll share with you later. So when I was mentioning that the author of this book talks about how spiritual sensitivity can be a protective benefit to kids, it can benefit against risk-taking, against depression, against substance abuse, against severe affective disorders, and the positive things that help create are meaning, purpose, and optimism. These are some phrases that they encourage you to introduce to your children, and these are just a few of them that I pulled out that I wanted to share with you. One is a transcendent presence. Another is sacred space, field of love. This is one that we have shared with our granddaughter for a long time, and she talks about it. And when she started preschool, we shared with her that even though she would be at preschool and we wouldn't physically be there with her, that our love for her was within a field of love that she carries everywhere she goes. And recently, she has created her own physical expression of what that means, and she will kiss the palm of her hand and then take both hands from near her heart and extend them out to the side of her body. This week, when I was working with two of my clients doing something I call cognitive coaching, I also was talking to them about the field of love because I had permission from their parents to start entering this idea of spiritual sensitivity. And when I talked to them about us sending love out from our hearts to each other, one little five-year-old drew a picture of what he called an A1 love heart gun that sent out a pink mist with little red hearts that came and just surrounded me. Another child, who is about seven years old, drew a picture of concentric circles around himself that had hearts in them, and they went out further and further and further until they reached the picture that he drew of me. So it's really wonderful to see as I'm talking to the children about these things that they have their own images. A little girl I worked with yesterday created a field where she used the, the idea of an actual field of flowers, and she showed a field of flowers that were hearts growing on stems that was so full of love that the hearts were all the way up to her shoulders. So another phrase is heart knowing, the higher self, the transcendent self, a culture of love, being highly attuned, and the sense of oneness with others. This is a picture of our granddaughter as an infant um, sitting on my father's lap, who was 97 at the time, uh, about six months before my father passed away. And this says, natural spirituality is a direct sense of listening to the heartbeat of the living universe, of being one with that seen and unseen world, open and at ease in that connection. A child's spirituality precedes and transcends language, culture, and religion. On the evening that my father died, we were taking care of Lucy, her mother and father, were at a wedding, and Lucy started making noises we had never heard her make before. And we went into her crib, and she wasn't upset. She was just making baby gurgling kinds of noises. And it lasted for quite a while. And during that time, we got a telephone call that my father had died. And so we called our daughter and son-in-law, and they came home from the wedding. 
And Lucy continued making that sound. Basically, we heard later from her mother and father until we actually left. And I had a feeling that it was the spirit of my father having come to say goodbye to Lucy and that Lucy communicated with him from the time he died until um, we left their house. Maslow, usually when we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we don't usually hear about transcendence. I know when I was taught about it, I didn't even know that transcendence was part of his hierarchy of needs. Um, but in fact, he talked quite a bit about it, and here are some of the key ideas that he had to share. It's a full spiritual awakening having peak experiences with illuminations or insights or cognitions which change their view of the world and of themselves. People who reach this level see the sacredness in all things at the same time that they also see them at the practical, everyday level. They recognize each other and come to all, almost instant intimacy and mutual understanding even upon first meeting. One of the things that I thought was interesting is for those of us who've been in gifted education for a long time, and when I was a professor at Pacific University in Eugene, Oregon, I taught all the gifted ed classes there. And one of the things that we would talk about was Dabrowski's overexcitabilities and the idea of positive disintegration. And now that I'm getting more into spiritual sensitivity, I'm changing my mind um, perhaps about what disintegration is all about. And this past week in Michael Beckwith's book um, on life visioning, he talks about defining what he calls the dark night. And he uses disintegration in a way that is making more sense to me. So rather than thinking as Dabrowski did about a positive disintegration and having a group of people at the top who were willing to give up everything in their lives, including their own families, in order to help the rest of the world, Michael Beckwith says, I define the dark night this way. The dark night of the soul is a profound movement in consciousness that unravels the entanglement of ego, metaphorically bringing us to our knees by taking us through a seeming disintegration so that we may reintegrate at a higher level of consciousness. Um, Michael Beckwith talks about how you may have had a relationship with the divine and then all of a sudden you can't reach it anymore. You're not hearing or feeling that connection and that's that disintegration, and you need to keep meditating or praying or, you know, relaxing into your higher self, because when that connection comes back, it will be so powerful. And in the book, The Spiritual Child, the author talks about something called developmental depression, and she says that most teenagers go through a period of depression where they really need a connection to a divine source that's individuated, where they feel like they can call on to something higher than themselves, and that when we help kids at this age with that and prevent a major depression, there's a greater chance that the, these young people will never get into a major depression. But when we allow the developmental depression to take over, and the children feel like there is nothing that they can call on to help themselves with, there's a greater chance that they will fall repeatedly into depression later in their lives. This is a photograph. Actually, it was a painting. And I had seen it online. And again, it was one of those wonderful metaphors that I like to find, and it's that idea of, 
a connection to something greater. And the title of this painting actually is Mindfulness. And I feel like we need to learn to root into the earth, to feel deeply into the core of our body. Because for those of us who are highly sensitive, it doesn't always feel safe to be here, especially as a young child to be able to fully embody our spirits within these bodies will feel very healing to children. So when I'm working with a new young client, I often give them a copy of this as a greeting card, and I ask them to tell me what they see here. Sometimes they turn the card upside down and they say that what's at the top here is actually the root, and that what is blossoming at the top is is like a tree that's upside down. Others would say, especially if the students are 2E, as many of my clients are, they would say that they are misunderstood because people only see what appears to be a barren tree at the top when, in fact, they have so much life teeming underneath that it's sometimes hard for people to understand and or for them to access at times. Another book I really like is called Belonging Here. It's a guide for the spiritually sensitive person. And the five common challenges of spiritually sensitive children and adults are, are these five things, and I'm going to talk about each one. So the first one is having what she calls thin skin. And when you have a child with thin skin, you need to create a strong but permeable boundary for the child between themselves and the external world. They need to learn to inhabit their body. Unlike the array of symptoms mentioned in the sensory processing literature, the children who have this gift are usually well-coordinated and high-functioning. The cure for the discomfort that they're experiencing is for them actually to become more sensitive and open, remain steady and open while the movement of life flows through or around them. So rather than being like me, who is a highly sensitive child and created armor and crust around me, it's taken so long for me to break that down that we need to teach them how to build up the light and energy in themselves and not be willing to take on energy that is not meant for them to metabolize. Another challenge is what she calls landing on earth. We need to help these children stay grounded within the whole of their body by mending their inner fragmentation. They have to find the innermost channel of their body and really build it energetically strong. People who are spiritually gifted often have particularly strong wills. And at the same time, they are also often extremely impressionable or malleable, as if they were actually made of a more porous material than most other people. People who are diffuse have difficulty feeling centered in themselves. They feel and look somewhat hazy and unfocused, as though they are somehow dispersed outward into the space around them. When I was young and my parents would yell, I would feel as though I was standing out a bit of my body watching myself hate what I was experiencing, putting my hands over my ears, trying to hide underneath the bed as though I wouldn't be hearing it. But actually part of me would feel like um, leaving my body. There is a woman in Germany who sent me an email about her nine-year-old son. And you might listen to this and see if you have a child who may have said something similar to you. She says, my nine-year-old son, you know the one I said was very sensitive? He recently had a baby and told me that he often looks like he isn't a part of the world. It nearly broke my heart. He also asked me if I would do yoga with him without his siblings so he can concentrate better. Last night, I did a body check with him. He loved it. 
he also talked about all his fears. And I he literally jumped and wrote amygdala on my flip chart that he wanted to explore our next session. So funny, this little guy. When we are willing to model and talk about these issues, we become a blessing to our children because they have a place that they're able to feel comfortable speaking about these things. I didn't wake up to all that I'm capable of doing to my all of my spiritual sensitivity until about a dozen years ago. And I wish I had had a parent who would have understood this or as sometimes people say to me, too bad you didn't have someone like yourself when you were growing up. But we all have journeys, and I'm sure I learned a lot from the fact that it took me this long to get here. So another challenge is hearing the cries of the world. This is one that only within the past six months have I be, been able to overcome this challenge. The action is to open to your joy, even as you respond to the suffering in the world around you. Become your own caretaker. Extreme sensitivity to the emotions of others and the spontaneous upwelling of compassion in response to their suffering is part of spiritual openness. It can ripen into the unconditional love and compassion of spiritual maturity. Children with this type of openness have not yet developed the inner strength to withstand the emotional intensity that they feel around them, nor do they possess the perspective to distinguish between another person's emotions from their own. Their emotional sensitivity may even hamper their emotional development, for they may never find the inner peace or distance necessary to cultivate emotional resilience. I am someone who would hear the cries of the world. You know, recently we've been hearing about um, the, the gra gravitational wave theory of Einstein that Einstein set forth. Well, I'm someone who has felt the gravitational waves of great pain. If there had been an earthquake or a tsunami or a bombing, any kind of devastation where people are just crying out in pain, it was as though waves would move through and come through my body. I remember flying home from a wonderful trip in Hawaii once and just feeling overwhelmed and ill and not knowing where it was coming from, very disoriented, and then finding out that there had been, you know, an enormous tsunami and earthquake and had killed many people, but more than the killing of people was just the angst that the survivors um, were, feel, were feeling. And I'm very happy to say that within the past couple of months, this has stopped for me because of work that I'm doing to really strengthen myself and become my own caretaker. My misunderstandings that I came into this world to take away the hurts of everyone else before taking care of myself um, have, have left me with some issues that I am happily working through. The next challenge is the shape shifters. The action is to remove the protective mask of the false personality to help kids learn to get centered and learn to be here and now. The potential for this aspect of spiritual maturity is often present and spiritually gifted children as a rich capacity for imagination. They may have difficulty concentrating on schoolwork that bores them when they can easily escape into more entertaining fantasies. With their head in the clouds, they may be ridiculed or ostracized by friends and family back on Earth. These kids are able to escape in a way that is even beyond what has been described by Dabrowski in the imaginational overexcitability. They may also create false personas that are, because of the children's depth and sensitivity, both deeply distorting and, as they get older, extremely troubling for them. 
If we observe children closely, we will see that the false smile, for example, can appear very early in life. These patterns mask and constrict our authentic self. And this is something that I visually see and I energetically pick up with some of my clients when I first meet them. They're feeling that they need to smile and make me feel that everything is great in their lives. I heard once about a very gifted college student who pretended that she was something she wasn't, even spoke with an accent, and when her professor was very concerned about her and called home to speak with the father, when the mother answered, he was shocked because the girl had led everyone to believe that the mother had died when she was young. So this can be taken um, very far when for some reason these young people feel like uh, they need to change who they are to feel comfortable on this planet. And then a stranger. The action is to make the return from self-exile to self-acceptance, <clears throat> to uncover the essence of their being so their preferences, aspirations, and talents are more accessible. Sometimes when I hear people talking about children who aren't achieving as much as they should, or disappointments, why if this child has such a high IQ, why isn't the child doing very well in school? Sometimes I think feeling like the stranger has something to do with it. Many spiritually gifted individuals grow up with the sense that they are in exile, that they are strangers in a strange land. This gift can also be a source of loneliness and confusion. As children, these far-sighted individuals often see what they are not supposed to see. And they see through the mask of propriety, the forced smiles, or the small and large lies that maintain a veneer of peace in the family home. The inability to fit in with one's family is a terrible dilemma for children who naturally love and need to be loved by the people around them. There was a little boy I worked with who was in the fourth grade, but he would go up to the middle school. It was on the same campus, uh, K through 12, and he would go up and have some classes with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And he told me a story that he felt like he had been born into the wrong family, and he didn't know why God would have done that to him. He was a highly gifted, extremely introverted boy, and his family were made up of extroverts. And as soon as he would get in the car at the end of the school day, he would just really want some downtime. But his preschool sister would be all over him. His mother would be asking all kinds of questions. And he really felt as though they didn't understand him and or know what he needed, and he just didn't feel like he fit in with that family. So one of the things that we can do for spiritually sensitive children is to create rituals and sacred spaces. I have met with many parents who have done this, and they, in some cases, people will say, well, you know, I could do, I could set something up, but my child will never do it. So then I say, well, it's like putting the oxygen mask on yourself first. You need to start with a practice for yourself. My husband and I have a ritual. Every morning we start off with stretching, qigong, qigong shaking. We do meditation. And it's just a wonderful way to start the day. With our granddaughter, we started playing a yoga video. And she thinks that some of them are funny, and she's trying them, but she's not ready yet for some of the things we do. But as she gets older, we will slowly start bringing some of those into her life. So some of the moms have told me by setting up their own spaces that some of their children have come in and joined them. And like the nine-year-old wanted to Sometimes we have to allow, allow a child, even if you have several children in your home, to do something privately with you because 
they just don't feel comfortable doing it with their siblings. So we start our morning using this DVD, which is Qigong for cleansing. And I really like it, and it doesn't take very long. And one of the beauties of Qigong is that it's a way to move energy as a way to heal your body. Many of us have um, stress or we have illnesses or just different kind of difficulties that may be caused by trapped energy. But for me, it's just a really nice way to start my morning with a ritual. And then there's meditation in its many forms. And one of the things that I really like about the idea of meditation is that there really isn't a right way to do it, but it has to be something that works for you. And I remember reading a book where a woman who was, had, had been an addict goes to AA and she's told that she really needs to meditate about 10 minutes a day, but she knows that she can't. So she decides to try three minutes three times a day and that she's capable of doing that and how that ends up really um, changing her life. So one of the first things I ever tried was some mindfulness meditation or heartful meditation through Thich Nhat Hanh. And he wrote a book called Present Moment, Wonderful Moment. And this is actually one of the meditations that he encouraged that you breathe in and think the word present moment, and then you breathe out wonderful moment. And you just stay focused on this moment, breathing in and breathing out and saying those words. And I was thinking this morning when I was taking a shower that he would say, if you say you don't have enough time for mindfulness or for meditation, then every time you get in the shower, be mindful of what the water feels like. I heard somebody else say, if you could get soap in the shower that has a wonderful fragrance and change the fragrance of that, it's really going to wake you up to the present moment. And in addition to what the water feels like and what the water sounds like, it would be what the soap smells like. Thich Nhat Hanh also encouraged that every time you hear a bell ring or the phone ring, stop and take the moment, take a breath, don't run to the phone and answer it before you've taken a breath. Because what you're going to hear and what you're going to say will be very different if you can be present with that conversation. One of the things I would like to share with you now is something that used to be very important to me when I was first learning about mindfulness and meditation, and that's musical mantras. And I really love the music of Deva Pramal. I've been listening to her for about five years now. And the one that I'm going to play for you is called the Gayatri Mantra. And this is one that when she was in utero, her father used to sing to her every day. And then when she was born, he continued that as when she was a child to sing it to her every day. And Deva has a YouTube video where she's singing this song in many different countries around the world. And at the end of the video, it shows her singing it to her father as he's dying. So it's called Gayatri Mantra. So what 
I've done now is I've gotten several of Deva's CDs, and it takes me about 55 minutes to drive through LA traffic to Summit Center, and I play this while I'm in the car, and it's funny because sometimes I think I'm probably the only happy person in the car on the way to work, but there's just something when you are used to doing meditation to music like this that then when you hear it, even if you're not meditating at the moment, it just takes you to a very peaceful place. Something else that I did when I was first learning meditation was an open heart meditation, sending love to my younger self. And when I'm working with either my young clients or my gifted adult clients, I talk to them about when they have perfectionism or when they're very tough on themselves, I ask them to practice sending love to the younger self because they would never put this kind of pressure on themselves if, if, if this was their child. And so I often will say to the adult, would you be expecting this of your child? And when we can start being the adult, or the younger child in ourselves who might still be hurt from things that we experienced as a child, if we can embrace the child and say, I love you, I'm going to give you the kind that people maybe didn't know how to give you when you were younger. I'm here for this to be a same place for you. It just really helps lift some burdens and then that little child in you ends up loving you as that adult because of the way you care for her. It's just a wonderful experience. And so I keep a picture of myself on my chest of drawers so that I see her, I see myself in that way every time I pass by the chest of drawers. There was a book that I read that I really liked called Hardwiring Happiness. And I think that this really helps, will help lead children to um, a greater sense of spiritual sensitivity. And he has an acronym called HEAL. You have an experience, you enrich it, you absorb it, and then you create a link. So for me, it was having the experience of Lucy leaning on my back and what it felt like to be sharing energy with each other, and then I really try to enrich it, make it last longer than, okay, I have felt this and now I'm thinking about something else. Or I've seen her experiencing the beach for the first time and now I'm going to forget about it. No, I have the experience. I enrich it so I really watch it and pay more attention to it. And then I try to absorb it into me. Because in hardwiring happiness, the author talks about how we Velcro into our amygdala negative experiences, but we leave the positive just quickly going by us and they don't stay very long. So we really have to have them, enrich them, and absorb them. And then when we have something negative happening, we have to make a link. And so if something negative is happening, I might take this photo of Lucy sitting on the beach, and put that in front of whatever I was thinking or ruminating about so that it helped hardwire the happy experience. It might be looking at a sunset and instead of just saying, oh, isn't that just a beautiful sunset tonight, stand there for 30 seconds, really look at it, really you know, enrich it and then absorb it so that you can easily recall what it felt like to experience that. And the divine is showing us all the time in ways big and small so much that we can be grateful for. Rick and I were walking home from a farmer's market one day and this butterfly just landed on the sidewalk and it just sat there flapping its wings, and I had just read this book, Hardwiring Happiness, and I knew it was a thing for me to stop and really, you know, enrich the experience, and we must have stood there at least two minutes, and the butterfly wasn't leaving, so finally we decided that, you know, we would 
go back, continue on our walk, and the butterfly flew away. But it is really a strong part of me now what it looked like for that butterfly to continue to flap its wings. That I was great. All right, sorry about that. It looks like we may have lost audio connection with Dr. Wilkes. So let me try to reconnect with her and hopefully we can um, finish up the webinar in the remaining 10 minutes. So give us a few minutes and let us um, troubleshoot this technical issue.
starting to get channeling that really helps me when I'm working with kids who have, you know, aphantasia and different kinds of things of what I need to do with them, what I need to say with the adults I'm working with. And this morning, I felt like one of my former university students who had died at a, of a brain tumor in her early 30s came through to me, and there was a message that I was supposed to give her parents. But I really didn't want to give it to them because I wasn't sure, am I just making this up or is this a message I got? And here's what I wrote down. Sarah wants me to tell her parents that she is a bridge to young people dying with brain tumors. She is happy. I need to wait for a synchronicity to support this message. Then I write, Sarah pushed me to send the message to her parents without a synchronicity. And then an hour later, I saw this on Facebook from the Damon Institute for Highly Gifted Children. The title of the little article that was posted was, Joyfully Bridging the Mind-Body Disconnect of Some Gifted Children. And I wrote, I went ahead without the synchronicity, and then I received one anyway. It was a great confirmation. So I just am going to tell you how important synchronicities are in our lives to let us know we're headed in the right direction. And now I want to make sure that I'm able to take at least a couple of questions. And I don't know, Lisa, if we're allowed to extend over a little bit because of the glitch. Sure. If, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat panel. We will spend the remaining time taking some questions for all of you. And Paula, also I want to give you a few minutes to go ahead and click on that chat bubble icon and see if somebody may have submitted a question directly to you that you can, you can address at this time. Okay. Let me go ahead and go to this slide. And again, feel free to submit your questions in the chat panel. Um, we are opening it up for Q&A. And just, you'll just want to make sure that you submit your questions to all panelists. That way, both Dr. Wilkes and myself will be able to see your question. So I don't see any. Do you, Lisa? I will go through my panel right now. And if you wanted to go back, Dr. Wilkes, if you wanted to go back to any of the slides. Um, okay. Okay. Why don't through? Yeah. Why don't I do that? Because I think the part on synchronicities um, is something important to share. This one was such an interesting one to me. I have two clients who have what's being called aphantasia, and these are people who have mind's eye blindness. They are very smart, very logical thinkers. In the late 1800s, they were called the great men of science, but they can't make any pictures in their heads, which makes being a language arts class very difficult because they don't make a picture of the setting or you know what's happening. And when a teacher wants them to imagine themselves as something and write, uh, they're just not able to do that, and they don't even really comprehend what, what the teacher is talking about. So I had been doing a lot of reading about making visual images and really trying to help these clients, and I went to go shopping and tried to use my credit card, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And I was trying to think, where could it be? And I thought maybe I had left it at another store. And then I thought, well, I remember that I had gotten gas, so maybe it had fallen down between the seats. So I walked out to the car and looked for it and couldn't find it and decided it must be somewhere else. Walking back to the elevator, pushed the button of the elevator at my apartment building, the doors to the elevator open, and all of a sudden, I, I get the message in my head why don't you try to use your mind's eye and recall where you were with the card and what you were doing? And I stood there for a moment and had an image of taking the card out of the gas pump, you know, put my card in, pull it out, putting it on top of the car and filling the gas. And I'm thinking, ah, uh, 
If I put it on the roof, there's no way I'm going to find the card. Walked back to the car, and there it was stuck on the roof rack. There was that card. And I felt like that was such a great synchronicity because here I was working on the idea of the mind's eye and how it really could help you. And then I was being told, go ahead and use your mind's eye. I, I love when these synchronicities happen because, you know, it just has to make me laugh. So I'm going to go back to this one because for those of you who saw a gun and probably wondered, you know, in a whole climate of shootings, why would I even and do this. I lost my brother to suicide um, just short of his 50th birthday. And since that time, I have very strong messages from my brother. And a few months ago, when I was getting ready to prepare this presentation, I was looking out the window of my office just thinking, I wonder what it would be like if my brother was still living in an adult right now and what we would be doing. I just really miss, miss him and I wish I could see him. And I closed up what I was working on and decided to open up Facebook. And there, the very first picture was this, and it was not even sent to me. It was sent to my brother's best friend in high school by that friend's brother, and somehow it appeared on my page. And in it, he, in the note, he said, remember when we all went to the desert and were playing with the BB rifles, and he included my brother's name, and he's the tallest one on the right. And it was just like that synchronicity that is so unbelievable. It was just like an electrical jolt went through my whole body. So because it was this great synchronicity of me missing him and really wishing I could see him and then immediately being able to see him, I, I just knew I needed to use this. And so someone wrote to me, so the mind's eye can help me find things? <laughs> That's really cute. Um, you know, I've been told before when you aren't sure where something is, just to try to really relax and see if you can go back to where it happened. I think for me, it was more of a synchronicity um, showing me the power of the mind's eye that I could completely go back and remember taking the card out of my purse, pushing it in, rather than walking back and putting it in my purse, setting it up on the roof um, just before, you know, I put the gas, uh, the gas pump in the tank. But yeah, not having the ability to use the mind's eye is a very difficult thing for kids. And if those of you who have kids who are 2E and they've been tested and nobody has done any assessment for mind's eye, which most, most kids never get assessed for that, we could go in a wrong direction that they, they have dyslexia or they have all kinds of things when one of the main culprits could actually be um, mind's eye blindness. So someone says the talk isn't culturally sensitive because her religion doesn't con um, condone any sort of channeling. And I'm not telling you that you should channel. I'm just calling what I'm getting a channeling. And the author of the book, The Spiritual Child, claims, as in one of the early slides said, that it is something that is capable of all people, of all cultures. And I am very aware that um, this idea of spiritual sensitivity goes beyond religion, that there are religious things I know. I've had a friend over before who wasn't able to look at some of the pieces in my house because it was against her religion. So I do know that religions, different religions do put different um, beliefs of what's appropriate and what is not appropriate. So I'm just going to say this is what I'm experiencing and I have not been 
a part of a religion or I do not belong to a part of a religion that is making me feel like what I'm experiencing um, is wrong. But I think that's a, that's a great comment, and I think it's going to be difficult for parents of spiritually sensitive children who are experiencing some of these things but feeling that it's inappropriate and they won't get the support. Um, and, and that's something that the family will have to deal with. And then when the child becomes an adult, and decides whether or not he or she will remain um, participating in that religion, that, that will be the choice of the child. But I know that many adults who come to me feel like there were constraints put on them for what was right or what was not right, and it was a difficulty for them. But again, as a parent, you get to make that decision for now. Uh, for what's right for your family, and thank you for sharing that with me. So if there are no other questions, I just want to thank all of you who participated today, and if for some reason you might decide you'd like your child or yourself to meet with me, I would be happy to have a short chat with you to see whether or not we would be a good fit for each other. For those of you who are teachers, I really appreciate what you're doing on behalf of gifted children. And for those of you who are parents, I hope that you are going to consider paying attention to the spiritual spirituality of your child through some of the things that I've had to say. And please feel free to contact me if you have other questions. Best Wonderful. wishes to all. Thank you so much, Paula, for, for presenting today. And um, if they wanted to get a hold of you, I believe they can find your information on the Summit Center website. My email address is drpaulawilks at summitcenter.us. Wonderful. And if any of you, if you, any of you logged in tonight, want to, my listed my email address here on this slide. But feel free to email me as well, and I can always forward your information on to Dr. Wilkes. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for this webinar, and thank you for hanging in there during that during that slight technical um, hiccup. And Dr. Wilkes, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us tonight and presenting. Um, your information on gifted children and spiritual sensitivity. And for all of those that, of you who are logged in, I hope you will join us next week. It's the final webinar of our annual series, um, and the topic will be Teaching Gifted Students Interdisciplinary Concepts, presented by Dr. Paige McCord. And again, that will be the last webinar, and that will be, wrap up the series um, for this year. So thank you again, Paula. Thank you again, everybody, for um, joining us on this webinar. and. Feel free to send us any questions or comments. Again, the webinar recording will go out, be emailed out to you tomorrow, so you can always follow up then as well. Have a great night, everyone.